Before we begin, I'd like to ask you a question. Have you ever known someone who had been disowned by their family? Have you ever been in danger or even threatened by your parents of being disowned? Elizabeth Bowman was an Amish girl uh, close to where I lived. Uh, I grew up close to one of the largest Amish settlements in the southern portion of the United States. It's a large Amish community. Well, back in the 60s, uh, Elizabeth uh, grew up in this Amish community, met a young man. They started dating secretly. She was converted to the Lord's Church and married, and when her parents found out, obviously when she was married and had converted from that faith to the Lord's Church, the Amish community had a funeral for her. They built a wooden casket. They put her possessions in that casket, and they had a, they had a funeral, and she was dead to her, her family and also the community that she'd grown up with for, uh, for her young life. Um, Elizabeth's husband, Danny Bowman, was the preacher of the Adams Church of Christ, my home congregation growing up for a few years when I was in high school and also in college. Um, to be disowned by one's family is an incredibly difficult thing to fathom, and we would expect that the reason that someone would choose to be disowned from their family Family would have to be strong and compelling and convicting on them as an individual. It's, it's a great thing to, be th to think about being disowned by your own family, but what about being disowned by God? So far in the book of Ephesians, Paul has detailed the great length to which God loves us and how He has made the way for us to be His children. Through His grace and His love, He gave His Son, Jesus the Christ, to come to this earth, to walk and to die on the cross of Calvary, to extend to us the avenue that we could have have a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ, and that through Christ we could be the children of God. And in Christ Jesus we have access to every spiritual blessing, including our great inheritance, which it is called in chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, and that inheritance is eternal life. But sadly, the inheritance will not be waiting for us if we are disowned by God. And so what does God expect from us in order that we continue to be in His good graces and continue to be His child expecting that inheritance waiting for us? And how can we ensure, in fact, that we won't be disowned and have that great inheritance taken away from us? Well, Ephesians 5, 1-21 through details what that is. And so let's take that time to read that passage. Ephesians 5, 1-21. through Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were dark but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is a shameful even to speak of the things which they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light, therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, but because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what is the will of the Lord. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is a debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in the Lord to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for the for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so here in this passage in Ephesians 5, 1-21, through what is brought to the forefront is the idea that we are the children 
of God. And just as we talked last week, there is an expectation for how children are to behave. You have an expectation of how you expect your children to behave. What they, are, what they can and cannot do. And God is the same with us as our Heavenly Father. And this passage says that God will indeed disown His children if we are disobedient. And so the question is, are you a child of light or are you a child of disobedience? Because your actions are placing you as a Christian in one of these two camps. Whether or not you are continually walking in the light as Christ is in the light, or you have chosen once again to go back into the darkness of sin. The Bible tells us that we can be assured that those who choose to go back into that darkness are going to be disowned by God, meaning they will have no inheritance. And the things mentioned in this passage that are going to move us from being a child of God to the category of a disobedient child without the hope of heaven are several things. One of the things he mentions here is sexual immorality. Humans are sexual beings, and God has expressly stated that that sexuality is to be expressed in a healthy way only between a husband and a wife in marriage. Anything else is a perversion of what God intended and is sexually immoral. We live in a culture that has been radically changed by the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s, and our society is one that has no shame and cannot blush, much like Isaiah said, and has gone, gone full scale and advocating and championing every kind of sexual sin, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and now even major universities and publications are defending pedophilia. Our world has gone completely stark mad over sexual immorality, and pornography is one of the largest addictions in our society that no one is talking about, and it's infecting our young people in epidemic proportions because of the ease of access to the internet on their smartphones smartphones and our devices. If we choose to live in such a way, if we live our lives chasing sexual freedom and fulfillment, we will lose heaven. There is no inheritance. That means there is no life eternal in heaven, no eternity in heaven with God and Christ Jesus for those who live in sexual immorality. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8, the Bible could not be more clear. It is not worth losing your soul over, and if you are struggling with this, then get the help that you need. Come see me or Peyton or the elders private but go somewhere, find somewhere that you can get the help for if you are struggling with sexual immorality. The next thing that we're mentioning here in this passage is filthy speech. And we talked about that quite a bit last week, and it's pretty basic to understand that as a Christian, our speech is to be seasoned with salt and that we should use our tongues to build people up and not break them down. The next thing mentioned in this text is covetousness, which is idolatry. The insatiable desire for more. The desire to have what someone else has for your own possession to the point of you willing to take actions to have it yourself. You want it so bad that you're willing to sacrifice yourself, sacrifice your actions, your moral standards in order to have whatever it is in your possession. And we live in a society, in a culture that is driven by greed and covetousness. It, it has even become a popular political platform uh, to covet what others have. Taking something from someone simply because they have more of it than you do and that you want it for your own self and your own selfish desires is coveting. I might not be going to their home and forcibly taking their possessions, but I'm asking the government to do it for me. And the end result is the same. The government just charges a fee, and I don't have to get my hands physically dirty, but it's still based in greed, lust, and covetousness. We should live our lives with godly contentment, which is great gain. That's what Timothy tells um, his child in the faith. What Paul tells Timothy his child in the faith. The next thing that we see here is drunkenness. Some statistics from the CDC. Every day, 29 people in the United States die in automobile crashes that involve an alcohol-impaired driver. That means someone will die every 50 minutes because of a drunk driver. The annual cost of alcohol-related crashes totals more than $45 billion every year. That's the damage caused to people, to property, because of alcohol-related crashes. In 2016, 10,497 people died from drunk driving. That does not include the thousands, tens of thousands of vehicle accidents that cause non-fatal injuries that oftentimes leave people injured for life. 
life. That also doesn't take into account the hundreds of thousands of assaults, including sexual assaults, that takes place while the assailants are intoxicated. Think about those numbers. If these numbers were coming from a disease, we would avoid it like the plague and invest billions of dollars into its eradication. If a foreign power was killing over 10,000 Americans every year, including innocent children uh, and, and leaving ten, uh, tens if not hundreds of thousands violated, assaulted, and injured, there is no place on earth the American military would not flex its might and the cost would be astronomical. But because it is not a foreign power and it is not a disease, although it truly is infectious disease, we celebrate it. We spend billions of dollars upon marketing it. We train our children to believe in a societal norm and we get Christians to advocate for its use. Oh, in moderation, of course. But it simply doesn't fit with the sobriety the Bible calls for the children of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. And the Bible says that if we choose to live our lives in this way, we have that choice. But be sure that God's wrath will come upon those who choose to live their lives chasing after such things. In verses 11 through 14 of our text, it says the disobedient children believe their acts are secretly hidden. They're doing a good job from keeping it from their neighbors, their church family, whoever it might be. But the text says, rest assured that it cannot be hidden from God and that one day He will bring all those things to light and His wrath is going to come upon those who choose to practice such things He calls the sons of disobedience. Verse 6 of our text. And so as individuals who are living for an inheritance... But think about this from an earthly perspective. If you had a parent and they said, look, Johnny, Susie, you know, me and your mom have been working hard over the last 60 years of our life. We've acquired this much wealth, but we have expectations for you. If you think daddy's going to leave you the keys to this empire when I die just because you're my kid, <laughs> you got another thing coming, right? You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you're going to have to earn it. I'm going to have to see some improvement. Well, we say, well, that's logical, right? That's, that's, that's understandable. I mean, I can see that. That's what Ephesians 5, 1 through 21 says. So God has an expectation for us as His children. And if we choose to go back into the darkness, if we choose to go back in the fields of sin, God says, I'm not going to stop you, but one thing you might want to know is that that inheritance that you're banking on that we talked about in chapter 1, it's not going to be there for you on the day of judgment because I have an expectation of how my children are supposed to live and these things are not even to be named among those who choose to walk after me. So the Bible tells us that we do have an inheritance waiting for us, Ephesians 1, 11-14, but God expects for us to walk accordingly. Now He says, be careful. Because there will be all types of comforting deceivers who will try to convince you that, 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 that those things aren't really an issue when it comes to God's love for you or, or the fact of your eternal inheritance found in God. But he says, don't listen to those deceivers because they don't have your best interest at heart. Paul would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3-4, through four, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, and they will turn away from sound teaching. But have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And it doesn't take long for you to go and for you to find those who would be comforting deceivers, whether they are preachers, religious teachers, society as a whole, friends, family, co-workers. There's always somebody there to help say, oh, no, 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 no don't, don't worry about those things. Everybody's doing it. That's just the way the world works these days. It was a different culture back then, you know, and we live in a different culture with different societal expectations, and you should really mold your life around societal expectations and not what the Bible has to say because it's antiquated and archaic. There's all kinds of false, comforting deceivers, but they're nothing more than a stumbling block. And so we have to choose. Who are we going to listen to? To deceivers? Or are we going to listen to God who gave us His Son? Proverbs chapter 2, verses 12-15 through 15 says, Delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of righteousness, who walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil, whose delight is in the perverseness of evil, and whose paths are crooked, and who are de devious in their ways. And so we have to make a decision. How are we going to live our lives? Who are we going to listen to? What are we going to say? 
The Bible here says in Ephesians 5, 1 through 21, that we can listen to deceivers and they may comfort you in your lifestyle choices, but be sure that they will provide no comfort for you on the day of judgment. I think about the illustration of John the Baptizer in Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Now, Herod the Tetrarch had unlawfully taken his brother Philip's wife, Rhodius, as his own wife. And because he was one of the most powerful political figures in the region, his friends didn't say anything, the people didn't say anything, but John the Baptizer was a prophet of God and he wasn't going to be silent. He said, it is unlawful for you to have your brother's wife. And because of this, John was thrown into prison and eventually his head was removed from him by a sword. Now when Jesus was told this, Jesus said that there was none born among women as good as John the Baptizer because John was going to stand for what was right. He was not going to be a comforting deceiver. Oh, when Herod was in his palace and he had those in his court and his friends and his buddies and those who answered him, I'm sure there was tons of people who said, oh, Herod, that's fine. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Completely against the law, but it's totally fine. Right? Do, do you, man. You're the king, right? It's a different rule book. John the Baptizer said, no, no different rule book. It's unlawful. Can't do it. Right? Because he wasn't a comforting deceiver. He was a man of God. And so we've got to make a decision. Who, who are we going to listen to? Comforting deceivers or the Word of God? All of us are striving to be children of light. That's why you're here this morning. Because you want to be children of light. You want to live in such a way that brings praise and glory and honor to God. You want to live a life that's going to have an inheritance of heaven waiting for you. And so how can we get there? How can we do it? The first thing we've got to do is we've got to live wisely and carefully. And if you look at our text, it says in verse 15 that we must live wisely and take care of how we are to walk. Wisdom comes from the Word of God. Ephesians 4, 14 through 16, the Apostle Paul talked about this in the previous passage, the previous chapter, that our enlightenment comes from the Word of God. That's where our wisdom is derived. Psalm 119, 105 says that God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. If we're going to be children of light, if we're going to walk in the light, then we've got to know what the Bible has to say about how we are to live. And we have to walk carefully, looking and making sure that we are taking the right steps, because we realize, 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us that our actions are important. Eternity is hanging in the balance of your decisions. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ Jesus to give an account of the things that we've done in the body, whether good or evil. What you do matters. Each and every day that you wake up, your life matters. If it matters to no one else, it matters to you. And it matters where you spend your eternal home. And so we have to be careful and wise and know what the Bible says. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen in his works have been carried out in God. And so in John chapter 1, we see the light has come and dwelt among us. In John chapter 3, just right before this passage, we're told that God loved us and sent His Son to die for us. And what is the verdict? What is the judgment? What's, what's the conclusion? The light came to the world and that men love the darkness rather than the light. And so we have to make a decision who we're going to place our allegiance, our loyalty, and our love with. The darkness of sin or the light of Christ? And that means we've got to live righteously. Jesus tells us these words in John chapter 3, but also in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. It says, You are the light of the world, a city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all that is in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus says that we have to live righteously 
and live shining as lights in the world. Now, in the ancient world, light was only given by the sun or by a flame, whether by a torch or a candle. And so light was something that you could see, but light was also something that you could feel also. We don't really have that today unless you go and put your hand up by that bulb, then you can feel the heat. But it kind of disperses by the time it gets to us. But light is something that should be seen and ought to be felt. And Satan tries to get us to extinguish our light for Christ Jesus. We had that Sunday school song, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to let Satan it out, right, blow it out. I was going to have Peyton come lead that song for you this morning. And I thought, at least I won't forget the sermon next week. What was it about? All of the lights, right? It was about the lights. We sang that song. No. But anyways, you just have to take my word for it. Anyways, how does Satan try to get us to extinguish that light? Because he's, he's very effective, right? Christ says you've got to go out. You've got to shine your light. You've got to make sure people can see that you're a Christian. They can feel you're a Christian. They need to see me through you. And Satan says, I'm going to do everything in my power to extinguish that flame. So how does he do it? Well, he, he tries a few different ways. Number one... He tries to convince us that Christianity is offensive. And Christianity is offensive to Satan, to sin, and those who are hell-bent on walking in darkness. And honestly, I'm not really concerned if those people are offended, right? Satan should be offended. Sin should be offended. People who are hell-bent on walking in darkness should be offended, right? Now, that doesn't mean we should be offensive, we should speak the truth in love. But if someone's going to be offended at us speaking the truth in love, well, that's on their soul, not mine. But Satan has done such a good job in ingraining our minds that the, the things you shouldn't talk about at Christmas, right? What are they? You can say it. Politics and religion, right? Satan, he's effective, right? If, if you're a Christian and you can't talk about your religion with your family, <laughs> something's wrong there, right? And so Satan tries to ingrain our minds that, oh, don't, don't say anything. Christianity's offensive. Don't say anything, right? You may, you may offend somebody. What if somebody's looking for the truth? And you never say anything because you were too afraid you might offend them, right? Speak the truth in love. Don't hear me wrong. But we can't not open our mouths because we're afraid somebody might be offended if we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Or this. Satan's really good at this. These are his main two. The second one, I don't want to be showy. I don't want people to think there's impure motives, that I'm, that I'm trying to tout myself in my good deeds or my good actions. Jesus literally says that the purpose for Christians to do good actions is so that they are seen. Now, we can't go out and blow our own trumpet, right? That's different. But Jesus literally says that the reason He wants us doing things is so that people will see us in those actions and glorify God who's in heaven. So tell me which one's worse. The person who does good deeds for selfish motives or the person who doesn't do good deeds because they're afraid of them being misconstrued for being selfish motives? Which one's worse? I think it's quite obvious the one who does nothing, right? At least the person doing it for impure motives actually did something, right? I mean, even though his motives are questionable, at least somebody was helped, right? The person who says, you know, I, I, I would say something or do something, but I don't want them to think, you know, I've got you know, impure motives. The purpose for us is, and when people say, thank you so much for doing that, we just say thank you and simply redirect their attention to God, right? God's blessed me, He's been gracious to me, and He's told me to be gracious to others. I've done this for you, but let me tell you about somebody who do much more than I can, right? And so, shine your light, live righteously. But to shine that light, that means we've got to go out there, we've got to do something. You are children of light. Get out there and get to shining. Make an impact. Make a difference. And when someone praises you, send their praises back to God. Shine as lights in a crooked generation. Paul says in Philippians 2, 15 through 16, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you will shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. The world hates the light, John three nineteen. but even so, Christians are supposed to be obedient to God and to shine their light. And if we as Christians choose to be ashamed of the light, if we reject the light, if we go back and start walking once again in darkness, the Bible tells us that we are no longer children of light, but sons and daughters of disobedience. 
And so one of the ways that we can make sure that we are walking faithfully is what it says here in our passage, holding fast to the word of life. And when we do that, we can come together on Sunday morning or Sunday night like we are right now, and we can worship God sincerely from the heart. It is impossible to worship God sincerely from the heart if you are living a life of disobedience. If we come to the assembly and we sing about stepping in the light, if we sing songs about Christ being our King, if we sing songs about the world not having sway over us anymore, and then we leave the building and we go back to walking in sin and living in darkness, then we were not sincere with our worship. But if we are children of light, then we have put to death the old man of sin. And if we are continually walking in the light as he is in the light, then we can come to worship and we can sing those songs and we can partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. And we can think about the fact that we have an inheritance waiting for us. We can worship sincerely. But if we choose to walk in darkness, we can come to services every time the doors are open. We've never worshipped because our hearts truly aren't in it if we're saying something, but our hearts and our actions are pointing to something else. And so in conclusion, as we come to a close, God has assured us that as His children in Christ Jesus, as we are walking as children of light, we have an incredible inheritance waiting for us in heaven. And we need to take that assurance seriously and rejoice that God loves us and has allowed us to become His children. But also, He has also given us another assurance. And that is that if we choose to live in sexual immorality and covetousness and drunkenness, then we are now children of disobedience and have been disowned from our eternal inheritance. And that we need to take that assurance just as seriously as the promise of heaven. And you can find yourself deceivers who will make you feel good about your lifestyle, but that will do nothing for you on the day of judgment, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth to those who have decided to walk as children of disobedience. And so I ask you today, are you in danger of being disowned? Not from your family. But are you in danger of being disowned from God? Are you living as a disobedient child or are you living as a child of light? And if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, think about the words in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7 through 7 that we know so well. This is the message that we have heard from Him and proclaim now to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If you're walking in the light as a child of light, look at your actions and be sure that Satan is not extinguishing your flame when you leave the building. Be sure that you're not keeping from doing the things that would glorify God and bring Him honor and praise because you're too afraid about those actions or your Christianity being offensive or those actions being misconstrued or, or, or misconceived as something coming from impure motives. Shine your lights in this world because this is a very, very dark world that needs the light of Christ in it. And if we're not going to shine our lights, those individuals may never see the light of Christ and have an opportunity to know the gospel. And if you're a child of God, but you've been walking in darkness and your inheritance of eternal home in heaven is in jeopardy, come back to the light Reestablish your relationship with God in Christ Jesus and once again have the hope of that eternal inheritance in heaven once again. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, heaven is a spiritual blessing. And like all spiritual blessings, it's only found in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And so put on Christ Jesus today by being baptized for the remission of your sins. Being put in Christ Jesus, you now have a relationship to God the Father, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 14. And having put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27, you are now an heir according to the promise that was given to Abraham. And start living your life in the light of Christ Jesus, looking forward to your heavenly home. And if we as a congregation can help you this morning, as a Christian, getting your life back on track, or by becoming a child of God today, come as we stand and as we sing.